Hello everyone. Since the 1980s, the bodies of women have been turning up in fields and forests surrounding Edmonton, Alberta. Many of these women were leading high-risk lifestyles, such as being involved in prostitution or drugs. Others were simply looking to hitchhike, like we've seen in the Amber Tucker case, a disproportionate number of these women also being Indigenous. There are as many as possibly 49 to 60 cases that are currently being investigated by Project CARE, which is a task force that was set up by the RCMP to look into these very strange unsolved murders. Rumors of a serial killer or possibly multiple serial killers began in the winter of 1987, after the remains of women began turning up around the city. Some of those cases we're going to be talking about today. The Globe and Mail actually constructed a map to show where these women disappeared from and where they'd later be found. As you can see, a large majority of these women would go missing from downtown Edmonton near a similar strip. And today we're going to be talking about a handful of these unsolved murders that stretch the decades. At the end, I want to know what your theories are and if you see any connections between these cases. Because according to law enforcement and now my own personal opinion after doing this research, I also believe that there may be multiple serial killers operating around Edmonton, Alberta, picking off the most vulnerable women around the city. And if so, not all of them have been caught which is absolutely terrifying and needs to definitely be talked about more. Our cases today start on September 13th of 1988, when the half-naked body of 20-year-old Georgette Flint will be found in Elk Island National Park, a remote area east of Edmonton. She was, as you'll see with the majority of the victims we're gonna be speaking out today, a prostitute. But sadly, I couldn't find any information about her Usually the family says something or a friend or someone that knew her will say something about the person, but there was nothing about Georgette, which in my opinion is really sad. It makes me wonder, did anyone ever care about Georgette? Was there someone out there looking for her, missing her when she disappeared? But other than this photo of her, there's no information on her. 22-year-old mother of three, Bernadette Linda Hennecke, was a Matisse woman last seen on September 27th of 1989 when she left the home she was living at with her children and common-law husband to go turn a trick for drug money. Her body would later be found in a ditch on a rural road near Sherwin Park on October 25th of that year. Her cause of death is undetermined. However, police believe she was only killed about a day before her body was found, meaning... Where was she all of that time after she disappeared? Was she being held captive? Was someone torturing her? We don't know any cause of death, but it really makes me question things. And from what I read, Bernadette's life was riddled with trauma from the time she was born, which is heartbreaking to hear. Her childhood was said to be filled with violence, neglect, alcohol. She was in foster care for about 10 years and experienced both physical and essay during her time there. Her family said that she would eventually go on to use drugs to try to deal with the pain of everything she'd experienced. She had so much happen to her in her young 22 years of life. Keep in mind, these women we're going to be talking about today were younger than I am now. And to think that she went through all of that in her life, she ended up having three children, she was addicted to drugs, and then she was later kidnapped and murdered. It's heartbreaking to think that these women experienced what they did. And I do think it's important to consider why these people end up in the places that they do. Because although these women are usually just written off as prostitutes, they were people. They were someone's loved one. And they had a story and a reason why their life led them to where they were at. Why they were leading these high-risk lifestyles. Why they were addicted to drugs. Why they thought they needed to work the streets to make money. And I think that's important to look at. 29-year-old Mavis Mason was born in Elk Point, Alberta and was from the Fishing Lake and Saddle Lake First Nations. Around the time of her death, she had a six-month-old daughter named Rose and was said to have been involved in drugs as well as Edmonton's prostitution scene. October 25th of 1990, Mavis would be found stabbed to death on a rural road west of Edmonton. And her murder, like all of these we're going to be speaking about today, has never been solved. 22-year-old Carolyn Aubrey King, who was Caucasian on her mother's side and of Matisse and Cree descent on her father's side, would go missing in 1997. Her mother last spoke to her on August 2nd of that year, when they had agreed to meet up the next day. However, Carolyn would never meet up with her mother the next day. And although most would usually find this strange, her mother didn't find it that strange because she said her daughter was actually addicted to cocaine and she was a prostitute who was battling mental illness. So it wasn't unlike her to be unreliable and to not show up to things and lose track of time. But despite that, there was so many wonderful things that were actually said about Carolyn online, especially how she was an adventurous, happy-go-lucky child. However, as we see in a lot of these cases, after she disappeared, it would actually take her mother weeks to try to get police to take her seriously and to take her daughter's disappearance seriously. And 23 days after her mother's first attempt to report her missing is when police would finally start to consider her a missing person. On September 1st of that same year, a young farmer who was harvesting crops in his family's canola field near Strathmore Way in Sherwin Park would discover Carolyn's decomposing body. Her autopsy would note that her bones showed scavenger's damage, which indicated to investigators that her body had been there for quite some time. However, her cause of death is inconclusive. 28-year-old Edna Bernard would last be seen on September 22nd of 2002. She was from the Whitefish Lake First Nations, and she was said to be a good mother who loved her children immensely. She actually had six boys, 
by the age of 28. I'm currently 28 and I could not imagine that. So I commend her for that. Now, according to Edna's family, her life had its ups and downs. It was said that as a child, she spent a lot of time in foster care. And as a teenager, she was introduced to drugs and the sex trade. According to Edna's mother, Cecile Nelson, the night of her daughter's disappearance, Edna was supposed to be meeting a friend at a nightclub in downtown Edmonton. This friend's name is Darlene. And she says that she last seen Edna in a vehicle with unknown people in Edmonton. Unfortunately, the day after Edna was reported missing, her body would end up being found in a rural farmer's field in Leduc County. Her fingers had been broken, she'd been strangled, and her body had been set on fire. Now keep the details of Edna's case in mind because we're gonna be seeing multiple connections with Edna's case to some other cases, such as bodies being found in Ladue County, as well as bodies being set on fire. 38-year-old Debbie Darlene Lake would last be seen on November 4th of 2002 when she left her home to use a payphone. She was also known to be an Edmonton prostitute and she would be reported missing the next day. April of 2003, her skull would end up being found by a person who was out for a walk near McKellen Lake, which is about 79 kilometers southeast of Edmonton. Her cause of death has never been determined due to the state of her remains. 30-year-old Monique Petra disappeared on November 25th of 2002 after getting a ride from a roommate to a hotel. On January 8th of 2003, her body would end up being found by a Fort Saskatchewan area farmer south of Township Road 540 in Range Road 222. Her body was frozen and it said that there was trauma to her entire body. 20-year-old Melissa Munch was last seen early January of 2003. Her body would end up being found on January 12th of that year in a field south of Highway 16, west of Range Road 220 in Strathcona County. Her body was also frozen, and as many of these cases seemed to go, there was no cause of death determined, or at least released to the public. Keep in mind that both Monique and Melissa were both found days apart in different farmers' fields in Sherwood Park. May 5th of 2003, 40-year-old mother of four, Katie Ballantyne, would be reported missing by her friend. Her mother, Victoria, described her as having a motherly nature that extended beyond family. She was a kind and beautiful person. She was actually the oldest of three sisters and three brothers, being born in the past Manitoba. Her father is Greek and her mother is Opuskawea Cree. Family members saying she loved the outdoor cooking, eating wild food and picnics, and that her and her mother would often fight over who got to eat the fish head for dinner. However, Katie's life would take a turn when she ended up moving to Alberta. Family saying that it seemed like she was trying to hide her lifestyle from them because it was turned out that Katie had actually become addicted to crack and was starting to sell her body to dealers to pay for it. And because of this high-risk lifestyle that she began leading, it made police not really take her disappearance seriously. However, it's weird that people say that. It's just the same as when police don't take a missing child or missing teenager seriously, where they say like, oh, they must have ran away and they'll come back. Because they're living a high-risk lifestyle, it's more dangerous, which should mean that you should take it more seriously that something happened to them. And they should have taken it more seriously because only a few months later on July 7th, Katie's remains would end up being found by a farmer in Leduc County. 27-year-old Corey Renee Ottenbright would last be seen by a family member on Sunday, May 9th, 2004, around 10 p.m. That night, Corey, who was a sex worker, ended up leaving her home to go work her section on 118th Avenue in Edmonton, which is a street that we will hear about quite a lot. Corey was said to have been a loving daughter, partner, sister, and friend, and it would actually take her family nearly a decade to get answers. But before we talk about what became of Corey, we actually need to speak about another woman. The body of 19-year-old sex worker Rachel Quinney would be found on June 11th of 2004. Four. She was also found in a wooded area east of Edmonton called Sherwood Park. Her family remembers her amazing smile, the way she always spoke her mind, and how she loved to dance, laugh, and sing. Keep in mind, she was only 19. She was still a teenager. Now, not much has been released on her cause of death. However, it was stated that her body was mutilated. Weeks later, another woman's body would be found in a field south of Edmonton, not far from where Amber's actually was. She was located in a remote area near Weta Skimwin after local hikers found her remains and called police. Around this time is also when police began to speak out, saying that they were looking for what they'd call at the time a multiple killer aka a serial killer who may have been involved in the death of multiple sex workers in the area at that time. January 5th of 2005, the body of 19 year old Samantha Burke will be found partially clothed and frozen to the ground in a parking lot behind an Edmonton trucking company near 127th Avenue and 78th Avenue. She was a teenage prostitute who had been working the streets for years to pay for her drug addiction. And she was actually taken in when she was a minor by Alberta's Protection of Children Involved in Prostitution Act where she'd actually meet another underage girl who was on the streets at that time. And I would say they were being essayed and abused because they were minors, although some people don't see it as that, which is a little crazy to me. And this other girl's name was Charlene Mary Galt, who at the time of Samantha's death was 20 years old. 
At Samantha's funeral, Charlene promised that she was going to get off drugs and get off the streets. Unfortunately, though, that promise wouldn't last long. Because only a few months later, on April 8th, around 9 p.m., Charlene would be seen working the streets near 95th Street and 105th Avenue. She told a friend that she had messed up and she had relapsed, but she was going home to see her mom. Unfortunately, Charlene would never make it home to see her mom, and she would end up disappearing and be reported missing on April 13th. By April 16th, her body would end up being found in an oil field near Camrose, a town about an hour southeast of Edmonton. And just like Edna Bernard's body, her body had also been burned, and the area around Charlene's body was also burnt. 32-year-old Dolores Brower would be reported missing by her family in June of 2005. She was a Matisse woman known by her nickname Spider, who worked in the sex trade industry of Edmonton and was last seen by police on the corner of 118th Avenue and 70th Street on May 13th of 2004. And this is around 5.40 a.m. Police say that she was hitchhiking at this time and trying to get a ride westbound. And it would take nearly a decade to find her body. Her remains being found on April 19th of 2015 on a rural property near Raleigh View, east of Leduc and south of Edmonton. A former police officer named Joanne McCarney actually knew Dolores. Joanne actually runs a street program that helps women leave the sex trade industry and described Dolores as a tiny, quiet woman who was often depressed. She said, and I quote, she was somebody who was approachable. You could talk to her. She was always sad and she had a really low self-esteem, end quote. Joanne last seen Dolores in 2003 when she was making an attempt to try to leave the sex trade industry. And due to the length of time it took police to find her body, her cause of death is undetermined. Now in a very strange twist, police would come out to say that not only were Dolores' remains found that day, but also a second set of remains was found. And these remains actually belong to Corey Ottenbright, who we've already talked about. Corey was also supposed to be in 118th Street when she went missing. And her remains were actually identified via a hair sample that she had voluntarily gave to the Care Project Street Program team back in 2003. And another detail that police ended up revealing, both Dolores and Corey's remains were actually found only eight kilometers from two other sets of remains, which also increased the idea that there was a possible serial killer working this area. Now, March 2nd of 2006, 37-year-old Bonnie Jack would last be seen at the Prostitution Awareness and Action Foundation in Edmonton. She was a known homeless prostitute and drug user. Her body would be found the same month east of Edmonton by two teenagers. Now, in a strange twist with Bonnie's story, she actually claimed that she was from British Columbia from the same town where Robert Picton operated. And she claimed that she actually knew some of Picton's victims. And unfortunately, even though she got out of the area, it seems that she met a similar death. And just like the very first case I talked about today, I couldn't find any photo of Bonnie. I couldn't really find much about her. In May of 2006, a woman and her husband would end up finding the body of 36-year-old Teresa Inez inside of a hockey bag, her brother's hockey bag actually, that was inside of her home, which was northeast of Edmonton. And she, like many of the others, was a sex worker. It was said that Teresa's body was wrapped in a shower curtain, garbage bags, an air mattress, was then bound in wire and put inside of the hockey bag. The couple would immediately turn in her 40-year-old auto mechanic brother, Thomas Svekla, and he would eventually be convicted of second-degree murder. The judge describing him as a needy attention seeker who has a grossly overinflated sense of his own importance. Now, police have actually tried to tie Thomas to multiple of these women's disappearances and murders, one of them being 19-year-old Rachel Quinney. And from what I read, Thomas told police he'd actually stumbled over her body while he was smoking crack cocaine with another prostitute. But in the end, Thomas would actually be acquitted of Rachel's murder. But it really makes me wonder how many more women was he involved in with these murders. And there seems to be a big belief that he's actually a serial killer and he has a lot more victims. Okay, so now that we talked about multiple of these women's disappearances and murders, what do we know? According to the information that I found, if we look at the 39 cases that are mainly talked about, it said that 33 of these women were found dead and six remain missing till this day. Now, as I've said, the causes of death for these women is pretty much undetermined, but I did see mention in one article that six of these women were strangled, three of them were burned, one woman was stabbed or there was some kind of combination of some of those things. The rest are undetermined, unreleased, or have been labeled as some form of suspicious. All of these bodies are usually found in and around Edmonton as well, mainly in rural areas. Five of these bodies are located within an eight kilometer radius of one another in Leduc County near Rolly View, Alberta. Seven of these bodies were located at a 15 kilometer radius of one another east of Edmonton in Strathcona County, Alberta. And out of the bodies that were found in the city's limits, nine of these women were found in Strathcona County 
County, just east of Edmonton. Five women were found in Leduc County, just south of Edmonton. Two women were found in Camros County, just southeast of Leduc County. Two of these women were found in Wetaskiwin County, just south of Leduc County. The four remaining women whose bodies were found outside the city of Edmonton were found in counties northwest of the city. And the other 11 women were found within the city of Edmonton. And as I said earlier, many of these disappearances happened from 118th Avenue in Edmonton, which is kind of one of the known strips where prostitution happens. So going off of all of that, what we do know from the cases I mentioned today, Dolores and Corey's bodies were found near each other or together because their remains were found at the same time. And we know that both women worked on the same strip. We also know that their remains were found at about eight kilometer or five miles from two other sets of remains. And one of those sets of remains was actually Amber Tukaro, whose body was found in 2012, but she went missing in 2010. And if you haven't watched my video on Amber's case, I definitely recommend going watching it. They did a full deep dive on what happened to Amber and her disappearance and her unsolved murder, which is what led me into doing this video. Because unlike a majority of these women that I'm speaking about today, they were all prostitutes and sex workers. Amber wasn't. She was in town on vacation for the weekend and was trying to hitchhike to the city as far as we know. What we also know is that earlier in the days, multiple women were going missing and it seems it was like a more rapid pace of time. And as the years have gone on now, especially after Amber was found dead, it seems like these murders have kind of fizzled off in a way. So at this point, we're not really seeing many more cases. So it leads people to wonder and speculate, did the killer die? Did the killer or killers get caught? Are they in jail? Or did they move on elsewhere to, you know, change up their MOs or do something? And it also leads people to speculate, is this all the same killer or there are multiple killers? In my opinion, I think there are multiple. And they honestly, maybe they're working together. Because we also know that two men have actually been arrested over the years for killing sex workers in and around Edmonton, Alberta, including Thomas Felka, who I had mentioned earlier, who murdered Teresa Inez and who is a suspect in multiple other women's disappearances and murders. But we also have 21-year-old Joseph Lebokin, who is a whole nother level of evil. And I think I wanna do an entire deep dive on him. In 2005, Joseph, along with Michael Briscoe and Stephanie Bird, picked up a prostitute named Ellie Mae Myers from the infamous 118th Avenue in Edmonton. According to sources, she was working the block to make money for crack cocaine. The three would end up taking Ellie to a farmer's field near Fort Saskatchewan, where the story goes that Michael and Stephanie would leave the car so that Joseph could have sex with Ellie. At some point, Stephanie said that Joseph and Michael began chasing Ellie around the field and beating her. The two men would eventually end up going back to the vehicle, and this is the point where Stephanie said that Ellie was laying on the ground, bloody but still alive. Ellie begged Stephanie to let her go, that she wasn't going to tell anyone, that she would just go up to the highway and she would tell someone that she had fallen and you know injured herself. Stephanie then said that she asked Ellie if she could get up, where Ellie said no, she couldn't. So Stephanie said that she then sat with Ellie as she struggled to breathe. At some point later, Joseph and Michael ended up going back to Stephanie and telling her to go wait in the car. A few minutes later, the two men would return to the vehicle, but Ellie would not be with them. A few months later, Ellie's body would end up being discovered. An autopsy would show that she had actually suffered a fatal blow to her head and the top of her left pinky finger was missing. And if that's not enough, if we backtrack to just after Ellie was murdered, two days later on April 3rd, Joseph and a 16 year old girl named Buffy were in his motel room where Joseph would end up showing this 16 year old girl the tip of Ellie's finger, which he had kept frozen in the freezer between two slices of bread. That same day, he would actually end up murdering a 13 year old girl, which when I started researching this and getting into it, I was gonna include it in this video, but honestly, I wanna make a whole separate video of it because there's just so much information that half of this video today would be about this man and these evil deeds that he did, these children and these women that he murdered. And he did this with a group of friends and with other minors. It's just, it's wild. Let me know if y'all wanna see it. I'm honestly gonna make it anyways if you don't wanna see it just because I wanna research it and I'm not just gonna research it and not share it with you all because I find this stuff just so fascinating and I wanna share it all with you. But let me know down below if you've heard of this because I had never heard of it. And the fact that he was keeping her pinky finger like a trophy in the freezer between two slices of bread, I don't even know why the bread was involved. I'm assuming he was trying to hide it between the two pieces of bread. It's weird and it's giving Dexter vibes. It's just, he he's giving serial killer in my opinion. But it leads me to ask, who is killing all of these sex workers if it's not just these two men? Because the cases still kept happening after they were arrested. From history, we know that a number of serial killers are known to go after sex workers because they are just easier to get. Less people look for them, less people care about them, and they'll willingly go into someone's vehicle, no questions asked. Whereas someone who is not involved in that and not looking to hitchhike are going to tell someone to fuck off if they're trying to get you in their vehicle. I actually had someone ask me before to get in their van that they were going to drive me home. And that's a whole nother story for another day. Let me know if you want me to 
talk about some of my crazy stories that have happened to me. Let me know if you're interested in something like that. I have quite a few of them. Things that I've experienced in my life that I look back now and I'm like, yeah, that that was definitely weird. I don't know if any of you have any of those situations where you look back and you're like, yeah, I, I feel like I could have been murdered if something different had happened. Um, but uh, let me know if you want to know about that. You know, I mentioned Robert Picton earlier. He was a very prolific serial killer that operated in British Columbia that also picked up prostitutes in the area. There, there was a number, there's so many. We also have to remember that the man that killed Amber Tukuro was captured on audio tape. I'm gonna play that for you now just so you can hear it again because this man may be the serial killer that everyone's been looking for. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you better not take... You better not take me anywhere I don't want to go. I want to go into the city. Okay. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? Are we going? No, we're not. Yes. Then where the fuck are these roads going to? 50th Street. 50th Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? 50th Street. 50th Street. 50th Street. Street. Jeez, right? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> It makes me wonder how many women has he killed and it's been decades and he's still not been arrested and caught. Despite, as you will have heard in my previous video, multiple women till this day say that they know whose voice this is, who this man is. There was also another person that came out that said it was his father. I think a very moving thing that I read was, and I quote, and yet we know that behind every woman has gone missing or has found murder, there is a family and a community who cared for her and deeply missed her. End quote. Because as I said, even though these women are just labeled as sex workers and their cases are usually not taken as seriously, these women had families, they had children, they were daughters, they were sisters, they were friends. They had people that cared about them. Some of these women were teenagers still when they were murdered. Most of them were in their early 20s or around my age. They had so much life left to live. They had so much promise to get off the streets, to get help, to get off of drugs, and to be able to live their lives to the fullest. Yet someone or multiple people out there decided to take their lives from them in very brutal ways, it seems. What I wanna know is how you all feel about this topic of the Edmonton killing fields. Are there any women or cases that I didn't mention today that you think are relevant? Because I honestly couldn't find information on all 30 to 60, whatever. There's I've seen multiple different numbers of how many women may be involved or being killed by these serial killers. So let me know down below if there are any other names that I didn't mention. And did you see any connections that I didn't? Honestly, there are so many different connections in this and ways you can go and clearly there's a huge task force looking into this and they still don't have anything which says a lot and are there any suspects that you know about that i haven't heard of yet let's have a chat with about all of that down below this is definitely a topic that i am extremely passionate about now that i've looked into it i think there should be more people talking about this i live in canada and i'd never heard of the edmonton killing fields i've never heard about all of these women being found murdered in and around there and it's way more than just sketchy. There is definitely something going on here, although it does seem like things have possibly fizzled off now, but that still means that there was someone out there or multiple people out there that need to be caught and need to, there needs to be justice for these women. There needs to be something done. And it makes me wonder what are the police doing for it? We do have Project Care if they're still doing anything at this point in time, because it's been a while since there have been more cases. But either way, there needs to be justice. Something needs to be done here. There can't just be a serial killer running around killing people and the police aren't really doing much about it, especially for decades. It's weird. It's definitely weird in my opinion. I don't know how that could happen, but it seems to happen quite often, especially in Canada. So with that, if there are any other cases you want me to look into, let me know. I definitely want to do a video on that 21 year old named Joseph that was killing multiple little girls and women in the area. It's just, it's a wild case and doing it with his friends and other minors. It's just, it's a what the fuck kind of case. And I'm surprised not, there's not more people talking about that as well. And that's not like a more common case that's out there. But yeah, let me know if there are any other cases you want me to cover. And as always, I hope you all stay safe out there. Lock your windows and doors and I will see you in the next video. Bye.